Um, so uh, Betsy Bishop with the uh, Vermont Chamber is going to be our our, our speaker and uh, sort of update us on sort of some of the things from the last session and then what's coming up in the, in the next legislative session. And then there'll be plenty of time for questions. And I think we're expecting a few more um, of the legislators as well. So there may be some time for, for them to chime in as well. So, but we'll let, let Betsy sort of take over from here. I see nobody likes the front row. <laughs> we, can, we can roll them out here. It's okay. Um, so I'm gonna stand in the front row. How's that? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. And is it okay if I stand here or do you need the microphone? Okay, great. Um, so, uh, Betsy Bishop of the Vermont Chamber of Commerce, it's great to see several of our members in the room. Thank you, and thank you for being a member of the Addison County Chamber of Commerce as well. Um, you know, somebody actually walked in this morning and said, you know, this is our, your, your business is your members expect you to fix it. So whatever it is, we're, we're here to try to talk about some of the things that might need fixing and some of the things that are going really well, too. So I'd like to thank Rob specifically for gathering us all together and putting this together and appreciate this so um, on your on your uh, hopefully you've been passed out as you came in we've got a couple of things for you to take a look at one is that the Vermont Chamber of Commerce has a four-person lobbying team so through our dues and membership we stand up for lobbyists during the legislature uh, during during the session and paying attention to issues year-round um, and we really think of these people as your your lobbyists these are people that you can contact on an issue. Maybe you read something on the newspaper and was like, what, what, tell me more about this, this has me concerned. Maybe it's something that you're, an idea that you think would help move the state forward in a positive direction. Give us a call, email us. Direct lines, emails, all right here. Pictures in case you forget what we look like. So two of us are here today. Um, I really focus a lot on tax policy, economic development, and health care. Charles Martin is with us. He joined us from Senator Leahy's office this year. And uh, he is focusing on environmental and energy issues uh, and labor issues. So he will be doing that. The two other folks, lobbyists, who are not here with us uh, today are Chris Kerrigan, who focuses on manufacturing specific issues that aren't the things that I just named earlier. <laughs> and um, then Rhonda Burns, who is our tourism lobbyist, and she focuses on all things tourism. Sometimes she gets a little bit of a reputation as the liquor lobbyist because a lot of tourism issues are about when you can serve liquor, who you can serve it to, what do you need to serve it, and what kind. So and certainly with our growing breweries and distilleries, we're seeing more and more of that. So uh, these are all the areas that I'm going to cover today. And as far as timing goes, um, I think your invitation said this is from 10 to noon. I'm not going to talk for two hours. <laughs> I don't do that. I don't do that well. Um, I'm going to talk for a little while, but I'm giving you a homework assignment now so that you can be thinking about it because probably in about a half an hour I'm going to ask you to participate. And that is, um, I'm going to talk about some of our agenda items and what we see coming up in the legislative session this uh, year. And then I'm going to sort of open it up to you to ask questions, either about things I talked about or things that I didn't talk about, talk about that you'd like to have a conversation with. I know we have Representative Sheldon here in the audience. Thank you for being here. I don't think I see, oh, I, a new legislator who I don't know, so. I'm Ruth Hardy. I was just elected to the state senate. Welcome, Senator-elect Hardy. So great. Um, and. Oh, I, I, you know what? I get a better put on my glasses. <laughs> Representative Lance Harris. No, here. no just, just come in. So I apologize for being no, late. We're, we're just getting started. But the timing was good. We had an active board meeting until 10. So that's good. That well, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Fabulous. Sorry, Cordes. Laurie Cordes, Representative Elect from the Madison Board, Bristol Area. Nice. And Senator Bray just walked in. So good to see you, Senator. So fabulous. When I get into trouble with your questions, I will be turning it over to these folks to say, help me out. So. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about um, the economic growth agenda that we have. And that is what, you know, we're, we're a business organization. So we're lobbying on behalf of economic growth. And so those are some of the areas that, that we touch most specifically. Um, and the other thing that has been passed out to you is uh, our, how we ended up last year in 2018. And I think that's mostly where I'd like to start. If you were paying attention to the news last year during the legislative session, and maybe you're a headline reader, perhaps 
you're reading in-depth stories. But I find most people are sort of reading their Twitter feeds and scrolling through, reading a couple of articles, the first paragraph, and not going too deep. But if that's all you were doing and watching the news, you might have come, come away from the legislative session feeling that there was a lot of rancor and a lot of struggle and a lot of contention, uh, a lot of conflict. Um, and while there was that in some areas for certain, there was an awful lot of an agreement. So uh, we had a very strong Democratic majority in both the House and the Senate last year uh, and a Republican governor. And so oftentimes uh, I see where people want to pit those two against each other. And what instead what I saw was a lot of working together on a lot of issues. Uh, and yes, there were some that there were conflicts about, and we'll talk about some of those today. But you know, when there's 10 or 15 conflicts, those take the news, but the hundreds of other pieces of legislation that were passed, initiatives that were funded, were done in a very bipartisan and unanimous, tripartisan, and I don't know what you do when you add independence, quad something or other. Um, but with broad agreement, and that's the space where we like to work in. Nobody wants to work in, in the middle of conflict. So I, I put that out to you as our position um, and what we see when we're working with the legislators and with uh, trying to make sure we're working with everybody, because the whole notion is we need to get these good things over the goal line, regardless of who's in charge. So um, in some of those areas, I think, um, we are looking forward to having that happen again this year. Uh, there's been a lot, since the election in Vermont, there has been a lot of uh, headlines about the supermajority that has formed in the House and how that's going to change things. Um, I think it will change some things, but again, a few of the issues. The majority of the issues are worked on in a bipartisan manner where many people are working to move things forward. So I see that continuing, and yep, there will be hot points around some various things. But um, I think that, that the, the legislature had in the Senate, they already had a supermajority. They were pretty close in the House last year. So the numbers have gotten slightly, um, slightly different, but I don't think the overall outcome will be that, that much changed. So the biggest thing in your personal life when you're trying to make decisions about whether you can do something that you want to do or not, in your businesses, whether you want to start a new initiative or not, it's the same thing in the legislature when they want to do something. It's always about your budget. It's about how much money do we have coming in and where can we expend that and allocate it. And if you want to do something new, or you want to do something more in addition to what you're doing, you've got to find that money either coming in or reallocate that. And that governs almost every conversation that we have in the legislature. There's wide agreement around some of the goals that we have in this state. Um, when I think about the big issues that are coming forward, you know, how many people want uh, clean water or broadband to every last home or any of those things. Nobody disagrees with those goals. There's nobody going, um, I'd rather not have any clean water, thank you very much. No, most people want that. The question is where do we get the money to fund these types of things? So the budget is the biggest issue that is threaded throughout every issue. Um, and it's usually the first thing to be discussed and the last thing to be decided. And so within that conversation, there's a lot of discussion around uh, new taxes, new fees. Uh, two years ago, Governor Scott ran on a platform of no new taxes, no new fees. And that was one of those hot points, one of those struggle points as uh, different agencies and different uh, committees in the legislature looked at well, what could we, uh, you know, we want to do this new initiative, what could we look at? So that was certainly one of those struggle points. Um, this year we start the legislature with about a $70 million gap between the revenues coming in and funding existing programs and what, who's eligible for what and knowing that. About 35 million uh, revenues that are coming in are natural growth from existing revenues. So there's about a $35 million discussion. Uh, depending on what you add to that, that can get a little bigger when you think about some of our long-term obligations. Uh, but that's not 
news that happens every year and that's what the budget process is about you know nothing ever stays constant so we're starting from that perspective so then income all the wants and needs we'd like to do this new program and we're in that line as well we have plenty of ideas um, and so that's when those struggles begin and and we'll begin to we'll begin to see that interestingly another change this year that I've seen is um, if you're reading the details in those stories and you're reading what the governor is actually saying and what his staff is saying, we've seen him open the door on taxes and fees. Whereas for the last two years, he's been, nope, 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 not going there. Um, we see him say, I will listen if somebody has a good case to raise a tax or a fee. Uh, and then he goes on to say something like, but I'm not inclined to do it. So um, I think, would somebody, from my perspective, I've been in this for over two decades, I hate to admit that out loud, um, uh, and so I'm, I'm a student of watching uh, what, what folks, what our political leaders say, and I can tell you that uh, that's a signal. Now, where that ends up at the end of the day, I don't know. What is the priority? Certainly it's not going to be everything. But I imagine that we'll end up in June with some new forms of revenue in some way, shape, or form. Um, and it just depends on, on where that is. But it won't be everywhere. Um, so those are some of the over, overarching issues that we're talking about. So let, let's talk a little bit about economic growth and what we can do there. Um, the biggest issue for employers in the state, anybody know what it is? Hiring people. Finding. Finding people. Hiring people, finding people. <coughs> yes, our workforce. It is the biggest struggle. So um, we have a sister project called the Vermont Futures Project that looks at data uh, and uh, in six key areas. And we have a huge amount of data around the workforce. And it's undeniable as to what the problems there are. We have a declining population, meaning less people overall. We have a declining participation rate in the workforce, which means people are leaving the workforce and not coming back into it. We don't have enough people coming into the workforce. Um, and we have an aging population. So some of that declining workforce is from people aging out and retiring. Some of it is out migration. Um, there's a lot of different reasons. So our focus and our main main struggle is where do we find people and how do we how do we recruit people to Vermont and how do we keep them here. I would put to you that that is one of the biggest issues, that is the biggest issue for employers and the biggest obstacle to economic growth. And, and I'm not sure if there's a legislative fix to that. So that is, that is where part of our struggle is, is so what do you do? Um, so three years ago, we started <coughs> beating this drum quite hard about our, our demographics and pointing to the loss of workforce participation and what employers are finding. Um, one of the things that had never been done prior to three years ago was we had never done any marketing to get people to live here, to work here, to build a business here. We spend about $2 million a year marketing this state for tourism to get people to come visit us. Uh, and so we, uh, at that point, uh, it was in the Shumlin administration, we went to Governor Shumlin and said, could we start an economic development marketing initiative? Uh, it had never been done, so finding new money for anything is difficult. Finding marketing money when there's so many other needs for people in the state is quite difficult. Um, but to his credit, he said, that's, a, that's an interesting idea, let's, let's work on that. So his administration uh, put $250,000 into the uh, uh, 2016 budget. The Appropriations Committee, thank you Representative Lanfair, um, looked at that with a critical eye <laughs> and uh, we ended up getting $250,000 in that first year that went to the Agency of Commerce. Now, if anybody's ever done marketing, and you want to have a big impact. $250,000 is nothing, right? We, we all know this. But I'm thrilled that it got started because what happened with that first slog of money is that 
the Department of Economic Development, the Agency of Commerce, created a, an uh, economic development marketing plan. Never before had done. Uh, it's a big fat document. It's also online if you want to read it online. Um, and it has been in place for the last three years. So when the Governor Scott's uh, administration came in, uh, we went to them and made the same pitch. This is a good program. Keep it going. Don't, 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 don't take that away. Um, so for the last two years, the legislature has appropriated another additional $250,000 each year to now start to tick off some of those items. You know, my dream would be to have this a million dollar marketing campaign, right? So that we could tell people outside of Vermont that you should come here, uh, you know, if you love us for a weekend, maybe that's skiing or maybe that's fall foliage or maybe you're one of those crazy people that come to a beer run on Saturdays and stand in line at one of our stores for Heavy Topper and then head back. Uh, but if you love Vermont for whatever that is, maybe you could love us for a lifetime. And maybe you could think about moving here. We've never made that pitch to these people. We have 13 million visitors that come to the state of Vermont every year. If we could convert one-tenth of one percent of them, that would solve our workforce problems. We need about 10,000 people a year, every year, to replace what we're seeing for that demand. So we right now have about a 10,000 workforce gap between the number of students that are graduating from high school and graduating from college and going directly into the workforce. That number is about 8,000 that we're having into the workforce. Meanwhile, when you look at employment levels, to keep at an employment level of about 1.5% rate of growth, uh, to account for the retirements, to fill the workforce for <coughs> seasonal and traveling nurses and temporary type workers, that comes to about <coughs> a little bit more than 18,000. So that's where that gap is. We know we're not gonna get to 10,000 more people in the workforce in Vermont tomorrow. There's no piece of legislation that we can, we can, we haven't thought of it yet. <laughs> Maybe today we could come up with that. But they're very hard to do. Oh, but over time, telling people that we want them not just to visit us for a weekend or a week, but to use that experience to come be t become Vermonters, become residents, that's sort of our main pitch. That's where, what we're working on the hardest and the most, and we think that the administration and the legislature have supported that for a number of years. So um, we think that's important to keep going. We'd like to see that increase. Um, there's a program, I don't know how many of you have heard of Think Vermont or Think Vermont Move. Uh, good, so if you haven't, I would encourage you to go to thinkvermont.com. That is where these initiatives are being uh, spun out of the Agency of Commerce. They are doing something called um, Digital Ambassadors for Think Vermont. If you are not one, I would encourage you to sign up with one. What happens in this, this is part of the economic development plan, the notion is to use all of us as echo chambers. Again, we only have $250,000, so there's no big media campaign. But the idea is every good news story that there is in Vermont, good news about businesses, good news about hiring, good news about investment, every good news story gets sent out to the digital ambassadors. And then if you are one of these, you, you, part of your agreement is that you will share it with your social networks. And it's getting quite a bit of play. So the further that we can go on with that, the more of our networks know about that, the more of our networks know the good things that are happening in Vermont. So that's part, part of what we're, we're working on. There's many other things left to do there. Um, the legislature last year, for the first time, really said, I recognize this demographic problem, this workforce participation problem as a key problem for, the, for um, businesses. And they came up with an idea called the Remote Worker Program. I'm not sure how many people have heard about this. You know, we'll pay you $10,000 to move here, right? Yeah. Um, so let me, let, me, let me spread a little truth about this program. <laughs> because again, the headline was, Vermont is paying people $10,000 to move here. Mm, sort of not quite, okay? Um, but this is a legislative idea that was passed in, a, excuse me, the Senate Economic Development Committee and the House uh, Commerce Committee uh, approved by the appropriations and the governor approved that um, as well. So this is an another area of agreement. 
The notion here is, is if you have a job somewhere else and you're working remotely, if you're working remotely, you can work from beautiful Vermont. We have so much, uh, so many amenities, outdoor recreation, this could be your home. We need more people here. So the, it is a reimbursement program and not a cash program. So if you say, oh me, you don't get 10 grand. It's oh me, but to get broadband to this place that I'm working, I need $1,000 or I'm working in a co-working space and that is $200 a month. It is a reimbursable activity. And so the criteria for that is coming out. The good news is there were over a billion impressions about this because now all over the world there are these people who are like, ooh, Vermont wants me. That's the whole point of this. That's the whole point of marketing. We never said that before. What we said is we want you to come here for beer, cheese, skiing, foliage, right? Covered bridges. All of that. It's, it's a great place to visit. But what we want to do is try to get those people to think about us in a, in a more uh, economic opportunity kind of way. So that's what the whole initiative is about. We will continue that. That is our, our, our leading um, initiative that we're looking for is a continuance or uh, even, uh, even in a tight budget year an increase and that is really important. What I don't want to see is there's $2 million of marketing for tourism to get those very tourists to come here. Very important industry in Vermont. Uh, in in um, The tourism industry employs about 31,000 people in Vermont. Uh, and those wages are coming up and there are career ladders in those businesses. Um, so we are starting to see that as well. What I don't want to see is us take away marketing from that and give it to that. That's that, that doesn't actually help the problem at all. That's robbing Peter to pay Paul, we can't, we can't have that. So we will be protecting that $2 million while trying to grow over time the $250,000. These are complementary marketing programs that need to work together. Uh, for a state our size, those numbers are really, really small. Um, but we have to start somewhere. So we're, we're grateful that we've, we've got that, um, that going. One of the other ideas that we floated um, that probably will take a couple years to get going is uh, there is a, a, a Supreme Court case that was solved this summer <coughs> called the Wayfair case, and it has to do with a collection of online sales tax. Um, there's a windfall, if you would like to use that term, of about three to $10 million that's coming to the state based on taxes that online uh, uh, online e-tailers have to pay to the state of Vermont. And we have suggested that we take a small slice of that money, maybe a million dollars, maybe less, to uh, think about creating a granting program for our downtown businesses. Our downtown businesses are struggling. And we all want thriving downtowns. We want sustainable communities. We're thinking about that. But you know, I, as a small business, uh, did some renovations at my business and I needed to, according to the ADA, I needed to put in a new handicap ramp because the old one wasn't up to par. That handicap ramp alone cost me $25,000. As a small nonprofit, that was, that was tough. That was tough for me. We did it, we had to do it, that's fine. Imagine a program where there was a partnership between the state and that private business to incent them to do the right thing. So maybe half of that money would come from the state and the private business would match that. The downtown would, would benefit from that. We also think that a lot of our downtown businesses need a little bit of help in upgrading in cybersecurity and online payments. All of those pieces connecting to sort of being an e-tailer and being online as well as being in the downtown. There's a program like this for farm and forest land currently in the state, and we're modeling it after that. Uh, that program is called the Working Lands Program. So if you may be um, familiar with it, it's a really successful program where they're helping private businesses who are in farming and forestry, and they're giving them uh, grant monies to do that. So we're trying to make that connection between the Wayfair case and downtown businesses. So we'll be bringing that into the uh, Economic Development Committees as well. Um, the other issue that I hear quite a bit in economic growth is telecommunications. How many people want your cell phone to work at your house? <laughs> right? How many people want stronger, bigger, better, faster broadband in your home and your business? 
Everybody? So we all agree on the goal. I mean, this happens everywhere. It doesn't, we were just in southern Vermont having this discussion, uh, having the discussion about broadband and telecommunications in Wyndham County. It's rough. It's rough, I can tell you that. Uh, if you've ever looked at that map in Vermont of where it's covered and where it's not, Wyndham County is, is, is a rough area uh, as far as coverage goes. So we all want it. The question is, what? Back to what I started with. It's always about the money, right? So um, I have been told to get us to that promised land of broadband to every last mile. That is $300 million problem from where we are today. Not, not what we've already invested, but to get it to every last place. So everybody has the same speed. Um, I'm not running for office. I'm not looking for your vote. So I'm going to tell you what I think is the hard truth, and that is we're never going to have $300 million to do broadband. Last year, there was an, uh, last session, there was an effort to raise taxes to begin a start of that, to invest in that. Uh, the tax that was going to be raised would have raised somewhere between $1 and $2 million to help build that out. If you do that math, it still is going to take a super long time. <laughs> even if you raise that tax to get there. So, you know, what's the answer then? If you are living in a rural area and you don't have great cell coverage in your home, or maybe you can't stream Netflix, excuse me, Netflix in your home, you live in a rural area like I do, um, it might be a while. But there are some really good things in telecom that we're doing about, and I think we need to change the story a little bit. We need to talk about the areas that have really strong broadband capabilities and encourage businesses to locate in those areas. I get it, it doesn't help the people who want something they don't have somewhere else, but as we think about our development, we're already directing folks into growth center areas, into industrial parks, into designated downtowns. These are the hubs that are covered, that, uh, that's where the investment has been made first. We should be continuing that story. That'll always be, always be an issue. Yes? Hi, I'm Marty Kolchak. Um, I'm a small business owner here, and I hear what you're saying about we need to attract people to Vermont, mm -hmm. and we need to spend some money to think about them relocating and we need to focus on our downtown areas. But if you try to live in Middlebury, it's expensive. Yes. If you try to live in a small town just outside, Ripton, there's no broadband, there's no cell phone. It's not a, oh, well, you know, too bad for Ripton moved to Middlebury. There's no place to move to. So affordable housing is a huge problem for bringing in the workforce that we need for our small businesses. Um, that really being addressed. Broadband build out. If we can bring a gas pipeline to people who don't really want it, and we can fund that, I think we can do some creative solutions to bring broadband to people who really do want it across the state. I don't see any creativity being used. We're really creative about forcing gas on people. We're not very creative about bringing the things that we want in the communities. I'm just looking at a different way of looking at it. Yep. And I'm not sure you're hearing that message from everybody. If you are, it's redundant, but that's the message I want. Well, I think that's a, I, I, I do hear it. I'm not, I'm not tone deaf to that, but I have to say, I, and you're right, maybe there's not enough creative solutions. During the gubernatorial campaign, I think um, Christine Hallquist came up with a creative idea as far as how we can build out broadband. Um, that, I, I did not go deep into the details of that, but that, premise was, well, instead of having the telecom providers provide that and waiting for them to feel like, if I bring this out to Ripton, I'll have enough investment there, um, you know, it was, we'll make that the utility's responsibility and that they will uh, do that. And that would come from us as well, as far as paying for that. So maybe that's exactly what we do need is creativity, is how do we do that? So the, to date, the solutions have been we need to raise money to put that state and private investment into those areas. So maybe there's more, more interest there that we have to look at. Just to give you an example, sure. Comcast sends me a letter once every three months that they'd like to bring broadband to my business. I respond to it, yes. Let's they, go. <laughs> they send an engineer out, says you're two miles from where we have service. 
they offered to do that for me for $100,000. Mm -hmm. You know what that is? That's not the cost of doing it. That's, we don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. If a handicap ramp can cost $24,000, and we'd like to do a public-private partnership half and half, I could get broadband to my business for a lot less than that if we had a reasonable cost and we did the cost share. So I love but they just don't want to do it. So I love this idea. I mean, you know, perhaps that's you know some sort of a, a granting program that we could talk about to, to do that. There are some modest state funds already. You know, perhaps they add to those. But I think that kind of concept, you've, you've got two problems going there. Where does the money come from for the other half? But let's just say, <coughs> that, that, but the real problem is how do you get the cost from $100,000 to something more more reasonable that both the state and the private business would want to put money in. The actual cost. The actual cost. And so I think that's something that, um, you know, I think those are the conversations that the Public Service Department does have with those folks. But Last point about that, the Public Service Department doesn't, doesn't govern it. Right. That's why I was just, I, that's why I said they're having conversations, but there's not that regulation there. But they've been talking about not having any responsibility for internet at the Public Service Board since I moved to Vermont. It would seem to me that we could get that part done. Mm -hmm. And you know, the legislators are sitting in the room, I hope you're listening, I mean, let's get that part done. Give somebody responsibility for internet. Yeah, I, I if, you complain about, if you complain about the internet for consolidating the public service board, the answer is we have no authority. Right, and I think the, their answer is that's the FCC's responsibility. Senator? Um, I'm wondering if the chambers looked at how EC Fiber is doing as a know if you feel like that's a productive project so far, something the chamber generally supports, might even be considered sort of a pilot that could be rolled out on a broader scale. Yeah, I, I think, uh, so the question was about EC Fiber, and um, I have not looked into that in depth, but I think the model is working. I think the people who have built that out, there was a lot of struggle in the beginning. I think that same model is coming to a couple of different towns where we're starting to see towns creating sort of a broadband effort on their own. Um, so I think that can work. The other interesting model that we're watching is what happened with VTEL in Springfield. VTEL got a huge amount of money from the federal government to invest in that area, and they have built that out, we think, we hope. Um, what's not happening from that is there was a lot of discussion about if you build, if you have this broadband you build that, that it would attract economic growth, it would attract people. We're not seeing that in the Springfield area. It might be still early yet, but there was a couple of hubs, and this is what I mean about, you know, we have to talk a little bit about where we do well, and that doesn't mean that we can't continue to address where it, it needs to be, but there are some spaces in Vermont that are not, you know, urban centers. I mean, I don't think of, you know, the Springfield area or EC Fibers in Orange County. I, I don't see those areas as being, you know, hugely urban. So that, I think that's, that's something that we can talk about. So thank you. Yeah. Or did you, uh, I didn't know if we'd opened it up quite for questions. We can keep time. going. <laughs> I have a whole bunch of other issues I'll get to eventually. We got questions. Let's go. I mean, this is sort of um, kind of building off a little bit about, about what you were saying. I'm Jen Drake here with Vermont Public Radio on the development and not news. Um, and so that, that point about how expensive Vermont can be and looking at the younger workforce who is going to be making less than their parents' generation and coming out with a lot more debt. And Vermont is incredibly expensive no matter where you go, rural mm -hmm. or urban. Yeah. And so how, how, what is the chamber doing, but also legislatively speaking, how is that conversation tied? In? Internet's one thing, but taxes, rent, food, gas, all of that is another that makes it really difficult for people to live and stay here. Yes, yeah, so I think that's what we often hear is the affordability agenda. Um, we often see that it comes out in the legislature uh, oftentimes in legislative conversations about we can't raise taxes on Verm working Vermonters because of all the things that you just said. These things are already high. Um, I will say that you know the housing piece is something that when we talk about bringing more workers to Vermont, we hear quite a bit from folks about, okay, but A, where are they going to live? and B, if we found places for them to live, they can't afford them. So we have affordability and availability problems. Um, 
there was a bill passed uh, two years ago to start to address that both in affordable housing and housing that's affordable. I'm wishing they would create two new names for these things. They sound an awful lot alike to me, but affordable housing is for folks who uh, they're of a certain low income eligibility. <coughs> the other piece was designed for so, sort of more of that working uh, Vermonter uh, housing that's affordable to them. So uh, they're, they're working, they have wages, they're not necessarily low income, but they're that ne next level up. So uh, that, but what was interesting is that was a $35 million bond that uh, was widely supported by, by all sorts of people, really helpful in the whole situation, but like go through that like that quickly because there's so much need. So I think there's some things that are being done, but these, all of these, um, all of these issues need to be tackled, and we can't. You know, we're a small state, so we can't do them all at once. And I think that is where that sensitivity is. Is as we see that workforce constricting, a lot of folks are waiting to see wages come up. That's sort of something you learn in economics 101, um, and we're starting to see that come up. But there are some real life things that we're up against with that as well. So yeah. Back to the internet issue, one of my favorite companies in Vermont is Waitsfield Champlain Valley Telecom. Mm -hmm. I would love to, to see us invest in Vermont companies to deliver broadband um, and internet uh, instead of sending our dollars um, out of state to a huge uh, corporation like Comcast. And related to that, um, I'm, I would like to look more at Veggie and the money that the Vermont Employment Growth Initiative is sending to curate slash Dr. Pepper, wouldn't it be better if we invested that again in uh, Vermont-based companies? Um, so yes, I think uh, everybody would agree with let's invest in Vermont-based companies, but um, all of Vermont companies are also, they're selling across our borders too. Not all of them, but many of them. So I think we have to think about a lot of Vermont companies are trying to think about how they can do business beyond our borders to gather. There's not enough people in Vermont to purchase all of those things. In the Comcast, Wakefield, Champlain, Valley Telecom, EC Fiber, you know, bringing up EC Fiber, VTEL, um, Wakefield, Champlain, Valley Telecom, those are great Vermont companies that are homegrown. Comcast comes in, um, you know, that's a, that's a choice. There's not public investment going into Comcast other than your bill that you're, you're paying them. So, but if there's not any competition in that area, you don't, you don't get that choice. So I think one of the, the struggles in this whole conversation is, so if there is a, you're talking about where you don't even have Comcast, you're talking about where you have Comcast but don't want that choice, where there's already that Comcast choice, um, that is not where the, attention is because there are some places with absolutely no choice. So I think that probably comes as a secondary priority to, priority to the places that have zero. The places that have zero would rather have something and then we can work on those choices, at least when you're thinking about investing public dollars. Yeah. How, how is the existing broadband infrastructure being expanded? Like in individual towns to get it a little further down the road or out to this hamlet or whatever. How does, what's the functionality of that happening? Because it seems to me that not only the organic development of these things further into the reaches where, there, where it doesn't exist now is very important, but when you talk about 300, is it billion? Mil mil million? Just million. million. Okay. Not just billion. Oh, only, it's, yeah. only, it's only million. When you talk about that's the cost today and the amount of time it would take to raise those funds in order to implement the program or the infrastructure to do that, by, by the time that, as you said, it's forever from now, the technology will be different and the cost will be twice as much. So, so, well, does so you have to, uh, right, so I start to think about, we have people who are talking about getting fiber to every home, they call it. There's a well, every governor for the last yeah, 25 right. years has promised that. Except for this current one, who, who <laughs> hasn't made the promise after learning from the last ones. But, um, you know, fiber to the home is a thing, like people want. But at some point, I, I have my 4G available to me. I don't actually need a line into my home. 
So not every home has that, not every business has that, I get. But as you talk about, the technology is coming along that if we take that time to build fiber to the home, and that becomes obsolete, you know, I think that. Well, that's so, what I'm saying, that if, if you expand what's existing, rather than just sort of shoot it out for $300 million, it just, it seems to I, I don't think anybody's, I don't know the structure nobody's is. shooting it out for 300, I want to be really clear. Nobody's got a plan to shoot it out for $300 million, okay? I'm just saying that, I think what's happening currently is the telecom companies are going where the dollar is, where the density is. So the reason you don't have it, I don't know where your business is located, but my guess is somebody's done a cost-benefit analysis and there's just not enough of you out there. That's correct. And but there is no density anywhere that justifies $100,000. Well, right. I, I think the, I agree with you on the hundred thousand dollars that there's something wrong with that calculation, but they are in in any event. Um, so I don't have to plan. I don't know that plan off the top of my head, but that's I'm sure that that kind of uh, information is available. I don't know if anybody else has the, the the state's telecom. There is a state telecom plan. I just don't have it in my brain right now. So unfortunately, yeah. Um. I hate, I hate to pile on so far. <laughs> I don't feel it's, it's not, I, it's right, not it's something I have not to do. Uh, I, 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 it's fine. I, I'm with you all. We want it everywhere. We need it. Okay. We just have to figure out how to pay for it. I'll just be, I just want to make sure that this is what you want out of this meeting before I we dive in here. But um, I, I, this is all really interesting. I just feel like we're missing major pieces here. Sure. Um, and also, there's some intersecting industries that I think are missing that would have to accomplish a lot of your goals here that I don't see here at all. I see nothing but renewable energy here. Mm -hmm. This is a wild display. It's a what? I just want to. So, was there legislation last year on renewable energy that you think should that had if passed? That you should folks be are our representatives in, in the same way that our our senators and representatives are representatives. I am. I, I just want to be clear. I'm not. I, I want to be clear if, what I am. I do not get elected. Okay. Yep. I represent the business organizations that are members of the Vermont Chamber of Commerce. Great. I'm a, so in that Fair way. Fair enough. Okay. I just want to be clear. No, I I'm not state government. I, I just understand. want to be really clear. I understand. Um, so we'll see who this is for the benefit for. We're talking yeah. to you and I. Maybe someone else. So <laughs> get it. But. Um, if, what, if one of the goals that you have as an organization and we have as, an or, as a group of businesses is economic development, workforce development, um, you know, all these different policies in there, um, there are solar companies here in the state of Vermont that could use the support and also it is a real resource that we can harvest even in one of the cloudiest states, states in the union. Um, it is a job creator, Yes. it is green, and it does not have the clean water problem that my friend re referenced when it came to natural gas. Yep. Now, this chamber, as far as, I'm, as far as I remember, was all in favor of natural gas coming in, okay. and that was a mild, wild disappointment to a lot of members of the state of Vermont, a lot of people in the state of Vermont, because it was one of the most off-brand decisions I've ever seen. Uh, we are, we trade on our brand, and our brand is clean, it's pure, it's, you know, Absolutely. that's why it says pure Vermont maple syrup, right? It goes <laughs> all the way through all of our branding, and you can ask, um, Rhonda about that because sure. weddings trade on that too. Sure. We do 10 weddings a year as a nonprofit. It's a small amount for us, but it's what keeps us afloat. And one of the major reasons we do it is because we have solar panels on the, on the lawn. Okay. It's one of the major selling points for us. Mm -hmm. And we're not alone in that. When I talk to a lot of different industries, that's what it's about. And, and so, Tab, I just want to finish. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, and so, to hear that like we all want clean water and no one's going to fight against that, bringing something like natural gas into the state of Vermont actually is an active step against it. And I just want to I just want to make sure that we understand that even if we're not supporting, even if there's no other bill that says the clean water bill and everyone's going to get behind it, by making these other choices, we're actually supporting things that, that go against it. And so, like, there's some there's some things there. Sure. Um, well, I don't expect this list to be supported by everybody. I totally got that. And this is uh, that list that you're looking at is things that happened last year. Mm -hmm. There are things that might have happened the year before, and all of that. So, I think as far as the solar energy goes, that piece of it, I think renewable energy is part of our economy. I think we are seeing that huge amount of growth. I think you're seeing a lot of businesses embrace that and helping with that, getting to our goals that we have of being 90% renewable, I think you'll see a lot of folks working through that in a lot of different ways. So I, I don't think, having an absent of it on here, um, I don't have an initiative coming to the 2019 legislative session that says we need to do X, Y, or Z in the renewable energy world. Um, 
because I haven't I haven't heard what that that piece of legislation is yet. Um, but I, depending on what it is, we may support that. So it just I'm not I'm not certain. There's a lot of things in play in our laws currently today that are encouraging that already. I, I guess I just don't see it here on your party list either. Okay. Anywhere. Yep. And it seems like it'd be an easy it's an easy thing to put in there, encouraging you know renewable growth. Sure. Let's talk a little bit about some of the tourism industry that you brought up. We've got, um, this year we've got uh, some, we anticipate the, an increase in the rooms and meals tax coming up. We see an increase in, um, we will be coming back to look at uh, Airbnb regulation as well and how that impacts uh, the world. Uh, the last two years the legislature has passed legislation on Airbnbs to make sure that there's a level playing field there between uh, existing lodging properties and the new world, if you will, in, in the Airbnb uh, world. Um, that's sort of a tough issue because we want to embrace uh, the Airbnb industry. The traveling public is demanding that. They want that. Uh, and people are engaging in that. So two years ago, we started to discuss how we can make sure that those, those types of properties are part of the fabric of our tourism world, but also how uh, they have to adhere to the same laws and regulations as a three-bedroom B&B, for instance. So uh, two years ago, the legislature passed a law to do that around the rooms and meals tax, and so that was passed, and made an, the tax department has made an agreement with Airbnb specifically to collect those, so we're starting to see those tax revenues come into the state for those overnight stays in a, uh, in a short-term rental property. Last year, the legislature passed another initiative to uh, make sure that those properties were registered with the tax department. Uh, and what happens from that registration is they get information about the laws that they should be adhering to. There's no enforcement, there's no fee around that. But some of that work is um, things that where I know Dan Brown just left from the Swift House Inn, but uh, some of the issues that we're talking about with some of our members and how uh, we're all in this, as this disrupts the tourism industry, how do you stay alive? Uh, so I think those are some of the, the things that we're looking at there. Excuse me. Sure. Um, is the laws that pertain to Airbnb complying with the meals and tax program, does that apply to VRBO and HomeAway and those other so companies the, as well? Yes, yes. The law says <coughs> if you are running an Airbnb, you need to remit the 9% rooms tax to uh -huh. the state. If you happen to be doing that through the Airbnb platform, they've developed uh, you don't you as the Airbnb you as the short-term rental owner don't have to worry about it Airbnb does it for you but if you're exclusively doing it on home away you as the as the owner would have to remit that so the law is the same it's just they've created a process for a Airbnb so the um, homeowners on home away and VRBO they're required to yes. submit it but there's no automatic correct the way it is correct. with Airbnb yes. and what's the uh, follow-up for the health laws for those other lodging establishments. Right, so there were 32 pages of new health regulations mm -hmm. that went into effect January 1 for all um, lodging properties, uh, whether you have a two bedroom uh, traditional B&B that's a business or not. Um, but Airbnb property short term rentals are not currently have to adhere to that. Uh, I think that's something that we will be we talk talking more about. We talked a lot about that last year, mm -hmm. and I think it was uh, a little bit tough to get to that. I think our ideal world is that you know if you're in business to host overnight people overnight in your establishment, you've got to think about health and safety of the people that, that you have. So, well, here under your thing, it says that one of your accomplishments was required for short-term rentals to comply with tax and health laws. Yeah. So. What happens is they register with the tax department and they get this reef of paper that says, here are the laws that you need to adhere to. That's it. Right. We, we fought for a little bit more than that, and we'll go back and have that conversation. But you know, it, each year they're making, uh, we're all gaining a little bit more understanding and trying to figure out how to not only embrace it, 
but not regulate it too much, but have there be some equality. Those are those are difficult conversations. In the back, and then a couple more here. The one thing that happened with short-term rentals last year relative to Airbnb is that the tax department allowed um, everyone that's advertising just on Airbnb to use Airbnb's meals and rooms tax ID. Mm -hmm. So the state is still blind as to how many sure. short-term rental properties there are. If you don't know how many there are, our, our debate continues to be what is the short-term rental market as opposed to knowing what it is because we'd have information if everyone had a tax ID. Um, so that's a problem. It is, and, and, our, and our position has been we want registration with some kind of fee. I don't care what that is, but you know, for have them be equal to the smallest B and B that's out there now. Um, but fairness and equality, level playing field. So if we had registration and a fee, we would know who these people were. We think that that money should go to the health department for enforcement, but only based on risk or complaint, which is kind of how it's done now if you own a three-bedroom BNB. And if we knew what the, the market was for and then we could, the market, we could craft meaningful, responsible right. legislation. We have no idea. So we're, we, we, I shouldn't say we have no idea. Airbnb has given us some information. We, we, we don't know. So we're, 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 wherever you are there. Yes. I would say it's, it's a little bit of a catch-22 because you have some people who, who run spaces in their homes out of an Airbnb as an income stream, and some do it because, as everybody knows, it's so expensive to live here. It's just like that little bit that they need to help stay in their home. So is there a differentiation between? There could be, but since we can't register, we don't know what is out there. We don't, we do know, like from, um, stories that we've heard. This notion of me being a retired woman in a big house, I used to have four kids and you know it's just me now and I have this big empty house and I just want to rent out a few rooms and use that to pay my property taxes. That's a great notion. That's happening. The law currently says that if you do this less than 14 nights a year, let's not worry about you. So there's a trigger already there. Um, there's a whole other thing that's happening in this world. 14 consecutive nights or just 14? I don't know the answer to that. I think it's total, total in a year. Um, but there's a whole other thing that's happening. Anytime that there's like a, you know, a want or a need, people are going to fill it. That's what's great about business. So people are looking at, hey, I've got a five bedroom house. I'm going to just, I, I'm, I'm not an owner occupant. I'm, I'm not going to live there. I'm just going to rent that out. People are doing that and they might have three or four or five properties. That's a different story than the previous one. The question is if we had registration, we would know. Mm -hmm. So right now we're kind of like, we want registration step one. before we start saying, well, it's, it'll actually be step three. Step one was get the, get the tax, that was two years ago. Last year was at least register somehow with the tax department so that they can give you that information. And now step three is the, that other piece. But, we're we're working on it over time. The industry's growing, so we're learning more with each with each piece. Yeah, this may be a question for the legislature uh, legislators in the room, but I'm curious about your thoughts too. Um, I've met multiple Vermonters who are renting uh, properties to specifically just Airbnb them when they have their own property, taking yes. otherwise available housing. Yes. How is that being addressed? Yeah, um, I think this is well. This is the question. This is that business model that we're we're wondering about. But you bring up the other piece of that is taking housing off the market. Um, we're seeing that. We're also seeing um, some trends in sort of the uh, older style um, the, the mot roadside motel being bought up and being transitioned into more maybe affordable housing. Um, so <laughs> we're seeing sort of, because these are properties that house people, right? So I don't think we know the impact of that yet. I don't know if she had mentioned interesting from hearing from legislators if they've heard about the housing piece. We have, a, we, have a, we have a housing problem in the state to the extent that you take that off the market and turn them into Airbnbs that are not registered and don't have to worry about health and safety violations. I think we, we do think uh, as representing into that industry that that's, that's an issue. Um, just stepping back, uh, in the beginning you were talking about that $10,000 initiative. Do you have any numbers as to how many people have come into the state with that initiative? Zero. <laughs> uh, it doesn't start till January 1. Okay. <laughs> I said that I said so right? Uh, it's like the one number I just knew right off the top of my head. Uh, so, um, <coughs> To be fair, there's only 
you know, that's, uh, gonna be, that's gonna be given. Uh, so most people interpret that to be a max of 25 people, but I go back to not everybody's getting 10 grand, somebody might be getting one or whatever. So some of the criteria are being worked out. The program doesn't really start till January 1st, so maybe when we meet here next year, I'll make sure I come with that number, because it'll be more than, I won't be that definitive, but it'll be more than zero. What's also interesting about that is there's been, a, I, I've heard up to 3,000 people who they now have, at, like names, we have contact them who said, I want to move here. Mm -hmm. What's great about that is that you can now serve them up other information. So maybe you might not qualify for this remote worker thing, but have you done this, have you done that? And there's some work going on to find out, well, why did you want to move here? What, what are you looking for for work? Did you know that that job is open here? So there's some matchmaking going on within that population outside of that. Yeah, Diane. So I just wanted to, you touched earlier on the Working Lands Grant, yeah, which, sure. is, which is a phenomenal program mm -hmm. uh, that, that I, I do wish we had more money to in, invest in because it's, it's something that's actually working yeah. for, for, the, for the things that we want to have happen. But I would be interested to see, because it's very similar to this conversation around the um, attracting from outside of Vermont. What I wasn't aware of, and that I learned more recently, is that many, no, I don't know the total number, but there are people from outside of Vermont who, because of the Working Lands Grant, want to come and work the land in Vermont. They're coming from out of state to come to work the land. So much like this uh, bringing in from out of state, I think we should take a look at how Working Lands is actually making okay. that effort happening right now. Yeah, I love that idea. State. Yeah, and so they're already applying. Yep. So, so, so there's numbers there that are are worth looking at as well of bringing in people. Yeah, that's a great idea. And that goes to it. Yeah. Okay. Well, to continue in this mode, sure. with the ten thousand dollar initiative, I mean, you're just bringing in, let's say, twenty five, maybe more, because let's say 50. of how. Okay. So we'll go with fifty. But it's just really just small numbers. It is. Why hasn't Vermont taken the initiative to try to aggressively bring in corporations? We have lost so many businesses, companies that were here that have left, because Vermont is not business friendly. They're not trying to bring in or even keep the companies that are here. So there's where you're losing your workforce, your taxes, everything. And then to compile that to say, okay, now we're going to raise the uh, rooms and meals tax. And you just keep putting a nail in the coffin of the people who are here. You, you, you're not making it business friendly at all. And, and even for the tourists coming in, they're gonna to have to pay more money to come to Vermont. It, it's just, you're, you're killing yourselves. So first off, I think that you need to try to retain the businesses that are here and be good to them and then try to bring in corporations. So there's a lot in that statement to unpack. <laughs> um, so did you want to add on to that so that I can answer those both together or should I? I want to add to it just a little bit. Sure. What she says is a valid point. What, what is even more alarming is that there's no succession planned in terms of retaining young people here because at some point you're going to have mass exodus of the young people for businesses outside of Vermont and what will be left here is just dwindlings and that is, should be concerning because at some point you're going to have people be like mass having people come in just because or oh, oh, have people having many kids just to retain a population here so that's a, that is, should be concerning. So I, I think these two things, uh, yeah, the, the exodus, the people, all of that. So just a couple of numbers around this. Um, trying to think about, um, one of the things I often hear is that if we could just keep our young people here, it will solve the problem. And I just want to sort of dispel that myth. That's not true. Um, the numbers don't bear that out. Uh, we have uh, about um, 9,000 college students graduating from Vermont every year. About half of them stay here. So if the other half, every single one of them, which is really hard to do, but every single one of them stayed here, that only fixes half of our workforce problem. We still would need to do something else. So yes, 
we should work to get more of our college students to stay here, whether they're from Vermont or from away. But we have to employ other strategies as well. And there's a lot of them being employed. Um, there's just, at the end of the day, there's just not enough people in Vermont. And that's total population to make that economy continue to go, as well as people in the workforce. As far as, I'm just gonna to touch on this, this people in the workforce for a minute. Um, as far as that goes, there is a recruitment strategy in the state of Vermont to recruit and retain businesses. Um, it is not without, fraught without details, but um, Vermont for many years, once upon a time I was a commissioner of economic development, um, so I, I did my stint where I sort of bought into this and I still do. Vermont is really not um, set up for massive large corporations that need 5,000 workers at a, at a wax. We're, we're just not that place. A we, a, we don't have the workforce, but we're, we're just not looking for that. What we're really set up well for is sort of those mid-level companies. We think in Vermont a large company is 100 or 200 workers. That's the slice that we're looking at. So when you use the term corporations, and I, I don't know what that means. I think that means different things to different people. You can have an LLC and be a two-person corporation. But I think our sweet spot is that thinking about that 40 person office that we're trying to move to 50 to 60 uh, type of, of um, economic development. That is where our economic, current economic development department is recruiting and is focused there. We have um, RDCs all over the state uh, that are working to expand those from, from that area to larger. I know Robin's here and Fred's here, so I'm sure you two could talk about that, certainly in, in Middlebury, um, what that looks like. But I think that on, the, on that piece of it, that's the strategy. So there is an effort to that. I just want to be really clear. Um, when we're thinking about our budget, the state budget is about $5.5 billion. The Department of Economic Development has 15 people who work in it. So when you think about what we want them to do and the size of their budget that they're looking at and the size of the number of employees that they have, uh, those are 15 people working as hard as they can in, for what you're talking about. So it's a relatively small slice of the, of the overall pie. Uh, somebody had, you wanted to add? I, just to her point, you know, it, expanding businesses or recruiting businesses to come to Vermont, to me, the, the hindrances there are things like Act 250 and other development legislation that, that, that is super costly, in many cases doesn't make a lot of logical sense. So I think, I think that is a more of a legislative fix than a marketing push. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't go out and recruit the people until you can have the infrastructure. You have to make it easier for these companies to come into Vermont. And that's the Thank whole you. thing, is it's, it's the initiative of what are you doing to try to attract businesses to say, I want to move to Vermont. And I mean, I, to tell me what the success rate is. How, how is that, that I think we doing? I think we do that in a, in a number of ways. I think we have some incentive programs in the state that we are, um, that are also very small. Um, that we utilize to do that. But the businesses that we tend to have success with are people who want to come to Vermont for reasons um, of their business plan, their market, um, things that they see about our state that, that we can um, naturally align with. And then come the incentives, as opposed to what many other states do. Is, you know, we'll build you a road, we'll give you bazillions of dollars and you come here. We're not really in that business at all. Um, we have a couple of programs that are in that, but they're, they're like tiny, really tiny programs. So I think that there's that. Yeah. So I served on the uh, Vermont, uh, on the veggie grant program along the way. Fred was managing it. And you know, my conclusion was that Vermont probably has the smallest checkbook to, yes. draw, to draw on for doing economic incentives to bring people here. and. Um, a company that will make a uh, citing decision based on incentives once will make that decision a second time. So I think it's even sometimes when we bring someone, it's a temporary uh, attraction. And that we always, our strongest calling card is built on other 
deeper Absolutely. values of, uh, you know, around the things you were talking about earlier, like recreation and um, health and safety, all those. Renewable energy. People yeah. want to come here for that clean water, for that pure brand that you're talking about. Companies <coughs> that value that, that's where our sweet spot is and thinking about that. And we have, we have to recognize that. The other thing I'd say is, just so we don't drift down the road of doom and gloom too much. <laughs> so, uh, Farm to Plate, you know, which I'm familiar with, uh, so there was a report out <coughs> early November. Uh, so it launched in 2010, I think, in full. 09 was a planning and development year. So we've seen um, 7,700 new jobs and 842 new farms slash businesses and over $200 million in uh, growth in revenues. So it's not, it's the small, it's like micro scale development. And it's, it's a much less riskier path because we're not trying to put too many eggs in any one big basket. And it also, uh, small dollars actually make meaningful differences to those small enterprises, so. And I think that's exactly why we're talking about how can we help those small downtown businesses. It's the same, the same notion and those programs are helpful. When you look at the overall growth trends, I think that's a meaningful difference to that small business. I think that's when we're talking about that. That's not the corporations that you're talking about. But the thing about Vermont is we can't, we're, we're not big enough to do just one thing. And it's probably a good thing that we don't do just one thing because when in 2008, when the recession came, our lows are not as low and perhaps our highs are not as high. But there's there's a benefit in that. We, we tend to stay in that middle band. Do you have to a little more farm factoid? So oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, we're often <laughs> legitimately. I'm not a. I'm not a, a. I'm not hugely knowledgeable about the ag industry, so this is great. Well, we're the number one ag county in the state, so it's yes. part of what we talk about a lot here. So uh, total number of farms has actually increased in the last decade. The what the press often is talking about, with some justifications. <coughs> the declining of our dairy farms. Mm -hmm. So, but in the overall ag food landscape, it's still actually growing. Okay. Excellent. Did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah. You just mentioned uh, people are attracted to come here for clean water, but we don't have clean water. And those of us who are in the tourism industry on lakes or near lakes are facing increased algae plumes yeah. and closed beaches yeah. and everything else uh, for a longer period of time. So, I don't know. There's a lot of effort going on around that. There's a lot more. I mean, the state of Vermont is under a you know uh, EPA order to correct that. I think um, I think there's certainly a lot of money going into it now, and I think that there's going to be even more. Um, I think that issue will continue to be at the forefront. I don't know what the solution is or where the revenue source is coming from. The governor has announced that he's going to put $15 million in his budget proposal to, to address that. Quite frankly, we need, I think, I don't know, maybe $68 million a year for 20 years, something like that? 25 more, I think. Yeah. So, so there's, we need, back to, we need more money. Everybody wants the goal, trying to figure out where that comes from. So I think. I, for one, am, am interested in finding out where this initial slot of money. But there are existing programs that are funded that continue as well that count toward that. But there's more that's more that's needed. Uh, yeah. Um, I was curious in terms of the, the again those intersecting goals that kind of fit sure. a lot of your points for your goals for twenty or priorities for twenty nineteen. Um, and I know there is a lot of buzz on it, so I'm curious to know where you're at with it or what steps you're going to be taking, which is um, child care. Um, because I know you're smiling because you're probably hearing it from all sides on this one. But um, yeah. The, yeah. So to me, it's, it's a, such a clear economic development piece because you're employing more people. Um, also, 21st century workforce, a 21st century workforce is generally one that should include women. And since women are disproportionately affected by those really tough family economic choices, right? Um, I'm being coy for a reason there, that's just obvious. Um, so, it just, it sort of hits, and also marketing Vermont, if, I will say this, like having grown up in Montreal, the $7 a day daycare thing is something that anyone who's involved in legislation, I imagine in the state, knows existed there for a while, and it was a huge driver for a lot of people. They've since adjusted, it was probably an unrealistic start, but it made a lot of that $10,000 remote worker kind of 
splash throughout the world. Interesting. And it made a huge difference, and it means that Vermont, that that, that area is a family-friendly place. And if we're looking for our population to grow of a certain demographic, it just sort of seems very logical that that's an intersecting point that hits all of your, so your goals. So, so, you know, next year I'll bring the Bible that I have that yeah. backs this up because clearly there's not enough space on the page mm -hmm. for you. But we, we, these are all issues. You know, housing's not on here. Right. We know it's a huge, huge issue. Childcare is, a, is a, certainly an issue. There's a, almost every issue impacts businesses and the economy in some way. So, you know, with four lobbyists, we're focused on what we can do. <coughs> we can't focus on everything and be successful. Um, but the childcare issue is something that uh, we're attuned to. How that tends to come up in the legislature is in a budget process um, around subsidies. Um, it's interesting as we've been, it's clear to me that um, I do this every year where we go around the state. We've been to Brattleboro, we've been to Bennington, we go up to Chittenden County, the Kingdom, we're all over the state. And I will tell you that of all the issues that came up here today that I didn't bring up, child care is coming up absolutely everywhere. And it's changed since last year. So I do this every year. <laughs> um, and there's not necessarily any new laws that have changed, but what has happened is it's, it's that crisis that has become um, a little bit harder. Some of the stories that we're hearing are a little bit um, uh, eye-opening for me and something that we just started digging into um, after our meeting in Bennington, was it Bennington? Um, where we had learned some of the priority orders for some of those slots that are available are going to people who are uh, not working necessarily. And so we're just, we don't know if that is law, policy, just that area or what. So those are some of the things that we're looking at is how do we cre create that incentive to have some of those slots for people who are trying to work as well. So I don't know, that's certainly not a solution to the no, child care problem, but it's one of availability and affordability. So uh, much, the, much like housing. The other thing, I'm sorry, I don't mean to question, but the, uh, the, there also was a crackdown, I think it was last year, there was a change in regulations yes. and we saw a huge drop and my child care provider is one of them, yeah. who just sort of, what I call, went dark. So there's a big. They stepped story. out of. They stepped out of the out of the sort of state. Yeah. You know, now we don't have numbers on them anymore. We can't track them, and so it becomes less. And it, we just made it harder. And she just said, quite frankly, I've been doing this for 25 years, and all of a sudden, it's harder than it's worth it for Is me she to in do. Digger it. today. There's a huge story. I in doubt Digger. it very much. <laughs> there's a huge story in Digger today this oh, okay. morning, which I read before I left, uh, that uh, talks about this very issue and um, about how the regulation, well-meaning to try to get you know, more people with higher levels of education mm -hmm. and, you know, more regulation around those home daycares. And there were numbers of how many have gone out, and obviously your daycare provider was one of them. Yeah. But I think those are, those are issues that, um, you know, folks have suggested maybe there's a way that we can have those as goal and people can show that they're working on those goals without necessarily having achieved them so that we don't. Because afford uh, availability is, is as much of the problem, so. Yeah. So can I just, I'll just answer Please that. Please do. <clears throat> so we, the legislature actually asked for this, you know, taking a look at that, the child care situation, because it is the number one thing that we're, that we're concerned, or maybe not the number one thing, but there's a very big concern. So so there was just released here a couple weeks ago that the JFO did a uh, child care capacity and workforce study. So that's on the JFO website. That just came out, and, um, and I'm more in tune to it because I also chair the, uh, the Advisory Council for Child Poverty and Strengthening Families. And so that was something that was that was really brought to our attention during some things. And it's a good report to take a look at statewide, but it also breaks it down by county and how many slots and talks about um, where you know we were, how many people did did not continue to work in this workforce because of some of the the regulations and what was some of the <coughs> dynamics around their closing. Um, they, they dove into that a little bit, you know, but we also have an aging population that was actually doing this care, that there's a natural retirement that's happened there. Mm -hmm. But the workforce issue in that sector is also huge to find people. There's not the pay structure for there. Mm -hmm. So, they're, so if, if you're low paid already, you're, it's, it's a tough place 
to find people to want to um, break into that business. And is the STARS program, there, there is assistance to help. Like if you're trying to get to four stars or five stars, you do get some, some help and some timing before you get there. But um, so there are some real issues around how do we help to develop that workforce? Mm -hmm. How do we incentivize people to go into that business? And one way would be to actually make it a livable wage and to help with some, some training on that. But uh, there is, a, I'm sorry, just a, there, I was on a call a couple months ago. There was a conversation around, and, and forgive me, but this is going to be more familiar than I am, but around reimbursing healthcare centers, or not healthcare, childcare centers to the rate that they were supposed to be in the legislation. If this is ringing bells to any of the senators or anyone else in the room, then please speak on it. But that seems to me to be something that's in the mix, as you said, like what's going on around it, what's the initiative that we can support, this seems to be one. Um, yeah. and Job care subsidy. That's yeah. the one. Yeah, so we're paying right now, I think it is, we were all excited because we could move from maybe 2007 rates to right. 2012 rates. So it's come up a little bit, but we're nowhere near. And Diane, the price tag on that is pretty hefty. Isn't it's, it? it's, it's like 42 million, yeah. I think. Um, we would, we've been putting a couple of million in. We've actually been putting some grants if we didn't have some one-time money so, so that if we couldn't sustain an investment, if we could help with grants to child care centers that maybe want to invest in a play yard, some, some one-time investments that would help their business, but yet yeah, doesn't go into the subsidy. And I'm going to say a number here, and I'm going to quickly regret that I actually say it out loud, but somewhere in the Welcome, day, welcome to my <laughs> yeah. Something like... 25% of the people in child care, you know, or slots, receive that subsidy, subsidy which means 75% are your working families that are really under a great deal of pressure as soon as we increase the cost in that world. So we have to take a look at, or wanting to take a look at it in its entirety, as well as the subsidies, the people that work there, and the pressure that we're putting on families who are already stressed. Mm. Yeah, so it, complex issue. You already got forty-two million dollars in. Um, Forty-ish, uh, and you know, trying to figure out where to get more to put more in. So it, it's like many other issues. Yeah. The figure I remember last year from Senate Education was we're nine point six million dollars shy of yeah. being yeah. current. I, I, I thought it was nine if we additional nine. Taste nine. along with inflation. We, yeah. So the way the legislature has to struggle with a $9.6 million ask is probably in increments. Mm -hmm. And it, this is when you're looking at you need $15 million for clean water this year, you need $9 million for child care you want, you know, money to invest in downtowns and farm to table. And it, it's, it's a big puzzle. It's a big puzzle. I feel like I would be remiss. Act 250 came up here ever so briefly, but Representative Sheldon, I don't know if you mind me putting on the spot. I know you've been all over the state talking about this, and I know that's going to be a big issue coming up. Act 250 is 50 years old, and Representative Sheldon is leading the uh, conversation around that, and that will come up in this session. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so, we get starting 50, we've done an 18 month process. We have two meetings left. Who's <laughs> <laughs> counting? Um, <laughs> I would say, uh, you know, what we learned, we did six public forums around the state. We learned that Vermonters support Act 250. 71% um, of Vermonters think it's been good for the environment. Um, kind of goes around there, quality of life issues. I think today we've talked some about a little bit of a disconnect our values and our actions are needing to be lined up around the environment, quite frankly. This might be a little bit, um, I mean, what, one thing we've learned, we're doing our report writing now, making recommendations. Um, our economy is doing better than our environment. And that's just the sort of truth of it in Vermont. We have uh, per capita income in inflation adjusted dollars has tripled since 1970. And we've gone from 33rd in the country to 19th in per capita income. At the same time, if you measure our water quality, our loss of forested habitat, our loss of working productive agricultural lands, things that we began to inventory and value 50 years ago, um, we're not doing as well in that realm. So I hate to deliver that message to you all. I know we need to work on regional economic development. It's a super important thing. 
in my mind it goes hand in hand with protecting the environment it's not antithetical but we have to start to line up our values with the pocketbook around water quality we need to figure out how we're really going to maintain what we call um, natural function in the landscape so that it's still a place that we can live but also the wildlife and our quality of life there was a cnbc poll that just came out we have who ranked in a business ranking number one for quality of life so i think that's part of the hand in hand thing with the economy we we don't have the vermont brand if it's not legitimately lined up if we have polluted drinking water if we have polluted surface water and if we don't have our forests to really see us through climate change i mean that our working we are so blessed to have 80 percent of our landscape be forested right now but for the first time in a hundred years we're seeing a loss of our forested landscape and i think that's a wake-up call for all of us around our quality of life in the 30 years i've lived in vermont wildlife diversity and abundance has increased but as soon as you start losing those open spaces we're going to start seeing that go back a lot of us live here because we want to interact with the natural world on a daily basis we can't lose that and we have to do better at it i'm hopeful <clears throat> talked a little bit about the changing political climate i think we're going to find some common ground on big things we might be able to do around encouraging development in our designated centers um, potentially coming to some enhanced designations that look to um, i'm going to say front load meeting the act 250 criteria that matter in our downtowns um, so that village all those five designated areas you guys are probably familiar with them um, perhaps can meet some of the criteria up front and then not have to go through act 250 some of our industrial parks have already been able to do that so looking at that um, i did want to make one comment about i'm, I'm disappointed that <clears throat> Uh, you consider it a setback that we change the threshold to half acre stormwater permitting. I don't see prevention as a setback in any way, and I don't think many of the people in the development community see it that way either. Right. I introduced legislation two year two by any ago, my first year, and got support from a lot of the development community saying, yeah, we see the writing on the wall. We have a water quality problem. It is less expensive to mitigate water pollution on new development than past development we're already needing to re, you know go backwards in time and address water quality pollution on the three acre threshold most development in vermont doesn't doesn't even make a half an acre impact right so i think we're still going to be missing a lot of developments we really all of us need to just stop forgetting forget the regulation and when when we behave in our environment stop polluting mm -hmm. you know if it's you at your house or it's you at your business it's it it's the incremental effects of our individual choices are are adding up um so i don't want to be doom and gloom <laughs> so i won't end on that well I, I i i'm gonna pull you back two sentences ago you weren't doom and gloom no. so i think that there's a lot of area of agreement here one of the things that we try to practice at the vermont chamber is sort of this this trilogy or triangle of our of our support and we think of those three points of the triangle as being the environment uh, the economy and social justice and sort of thinking about social justice as expressing fairness uh, the environment is thinking about preservation and thinking about uh, the economy as opportunity you need all three points of that triangle to be strong in order to have the life and what we want here that's why we're here you, you actually <laughs> said it very well like this is why we live here we talked about economic development and recruiting businesses, and I talked a little bit about the types of businesses that we recruit. They've got to believe in what we believe in and having this outdoor environment that we, we value and having that. So we'll be coming to the Act 250 discussions with that in mind. Um, Charles will be our, our point person on that. And we, you know, our, our first statement is we want to strengthen Act 250. Uh, we want to make sure that it continues in the way that it is. There are some things that we think we can do to ease uh, some restrictions on development in the designated areas, as Representative Sheldon talked about. We think that's the way to go. We've gone through all this effort, this planning effort in the state to, to create, and I call them circles. They're never circles, but you know, like circles around certain areas. This is a designated downtown. This is an industrial park. This is a growth center. This is an emerging town center. There are all these, I think you said there are five designations. I, I must have missed one there. But, 
but and they're never circles. They're usually like oddly drawn things. But um, if if we've gone through all the planning and the input and the the municipal um, effort and the state effort to say this is a designation of this is where we want growth to occur, we should then let growth occur there in a in an enhanced way and in a faster way. And I think. There are some benefits there. I think there probably needs to be a little bit more work there. So I'm, I'm pleased to hear you say that. I think that's an area of agreement that we, we will be working on to try to think about growth in that area. We can all discuss what happens outside of those areas as well. But I think, again, looking for common areas of agreement, that's an area that we can we can work on first. Yeah? Um, one uh, Another piece of the quote of Vermont brand, which I don't want to say, it almost sounds like we're cheapening it, but uh, <laughs> the is uh, when I've talked to people about why they move here, um, education, mm -hmm. public education is another one. So we haven't gotten into that conversation here today, but and it <laughs> could be a very big one. But quality of our public education, I think, is um, regularly I talk to families and I say that's why they're here. And I, I'm, sadly, I had my first visit at a door this fall campaigning where someone said, it's great through middle school where I live, which I'll go unnamed, um, but not after that. And they were moving to uh, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So that's the first time I've heard someone say, okay, also in the news it's lady. not this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's like a canary in a, in a coal mine. Right. So um, I, I think education, so think about the reasons people move here, right? At, at the end of the day, everybody's got their own personal reasons, but we can really coalesce them around a couple of things. And I think um, our quality of life is what attracts people to even think about moving to Vermont, first and foremost. Whether they you know, grew up here and left, whether they came to college and stayed, or whether they were tourists and, and are like, how do, how do I make that a lifestyle? It's the attraction of this place, it's the sense of our community, it is the ability to go out for a nice bike ride after after work, whatever, whatever that, that recreational activity looks like to you. I think that's the first that gets you dreaming. I think that's where we need to tap into those people first, is to get them dreaming in reality. The second one that comes pretty quick is, well, I could only make that dream come true if there was an economic opportunity for me. Can I find a job there? Can I find a job that pays enough to afford a house and childcare and all those things that we've talked about today? I think, I think that certainly happens too. Um, and once you've made sort of some of those choices, you're also thinking about education. Part of that, that um, environment that we're talking about uh, of people wanting is sort of that clean air, that you know, uh, whatever that slice of heaven is to you, maybe it's an extremely rural place that you live like where I live, maybe it's a little bit more of sort of the, the downtown uh, townhouse that you could have. Um, everybody's got a different picture of what that looks like, but we have that in Vermont, and I think that's what, what people want, is that sense of community. And frankly, those are the people that we should go trolling to, because if you try to troll to people who want you know, high rises in the downtown and big, huge cities, we're not gonna win with that. I've got two 20-somethings, they're not here, they're living in cities and they're having a ball. <laughs> Maybe later in life, <laughs> when they you know settle down or whatever, they'll think about having what we have here, but we have to think about marketing to those people who want what we have. Yeah. But it would be nice to keep our young people here. Absolutely. Too. And I, I would love my new I have three, uh, 20, now almost, th now 130 something, and two of them live out of state because uh, they couldn't afford to pay their student loans if they stay here. And the third was is a nurse at UVM, and I felt, feel a little disappointed that um, we didn't support the nurses strike more because their argument was, oh, we're going to pay nurses in Vermont less because it's such a nice place to live. When she sees a revolving door at, she happens to be in the, in the emergency room at UVM, people's nurses that are here and they know they can make so much more money elsewhere. elsewhere. And she can barely afford living in Burlington. Well, living in Burlington. And and paying her student debt, and and there's this carrot in almost every other hospital in the country that will pay her more. So it was, you know, it's like we need to try to keep, and that's a, you know, our population is aging. We're going to need more healthcare workers, so we yes. need to pay them so that they'll come here. Yeah. Well, I'm always going to piggyback on those things that keep young people in the state. So 
being a, um, in HR, um, I know that you said that half of the people come to school here, but I can guarantee you that if we track those, the other half, they're no longer here. Because cost of living is very skewed for the state of Vermont. I moved here, and when I looked at this cost of living, it was very skewed until you, got, you get here and you realize that it doesn't quite add up. And that's because during the summer, you have those people who own vacation homes here who have huge property. They don't live here all year long, and they ride, they raise their cost of living to make it seem as if everybody's on equal footing, whereas there's no equity here in the state. Mm. And that is a problem. <coughs> and that's why young people are being forced out. It's not because they want to leave. It's right. because they're being forced out. Right. That is a bigger issue, actually. <coughs> a, that is a big issue. I just yeah. want to bring up the, um, yes, it's incredibly important that we work on affordable housing and uh, child care, um, but I also want to point out um, that data showed this year, there's a report that was published by VPR that showed there's actually a net influx of young people into Vermont, particularly in the age range of 20 to 34, so we have to be careful. My own um, kids. One of them left for a while. She went to University of North Florida, but she did come back. Um, so while it, it absolutely is important to make sure that we have the things that um, young people and young families need um, to thrive in Vermont, we have to be working with accurate information. So, right, so um, when you look at the cohorts, all that data is right, but when you look at the overall, so I think there's just different data points that add up to the same thing. So I think I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. I'm just saying that there are um, there are ways that we can work to have even more young people stay. Those numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I was at a meeting earlier this week, and uh, Patricia Morton, who's the uh, president, VTC mm -hmm. from Tech, was talking about their situation there, the state college situation largely, it was really appalling to hear the numbers that they have to work with and what they're up against. And it really is uh, incredibly unfortunate that we spend so much money on education, but not on post-secondary. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, kids can go cheaper to state schools outside Vermont than they can to Vermont state schools. Mm -hmm. And they're doing that. And uh, Vermont Tech is doing a bang up job with a lot of their programs and working really hard, but yet they're still looking at deficits because mm -hmm. it's just not the students no. there, you, you know, to, to, to pay the tuition. And uh, she said that, you know, the majority, it's more than 50% of their students stay, graduates stay in Vermont. And even their out of state students that come to Vermont are staying in Vermont. And that's and one of the story. reasons is because Vermont Tech does a phenomenal job in placing their students. Mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. the employers of this state know what they're getting from Vermont Tech and want those students. Yeah. I mean, they have an incredible story. Actually. She said they've got five students from last year that aren't placed, and she knows who they are. <laughs> Three of them are not looking. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a beauty in our smallness, and that's it. The president of the college knows who you are. <laughs> She's shopping your resume. That's great. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. When we talk about the Vermont brand and and for people that businesses that have a product that they can sell. I mean, if you're, as an example, cooking granola in Connecticut and trying to sell it in Connecticut, uh, but then you recognize that if you're selling granola in Vermont, there's a percentage difference on what you can sell that granola yeah. for. Is there any data that shows what that differential is? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Sure is. Yes. Yes. Not to bash Connecticut. No, no, no. Not to say any state. We're way better. Any state. There is a differential. Do you want to add, jump, jump in there? Well, just a, the re, a report I remember from roughly eight years ago showed that roughly comparable products, like food products out of Vermont, uh, is being sold outside the state. The Vermont product next to the non-Vermont product gleaned a 15 to 27 percent premium in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So that to me is marketable. The, is, yes. It's marketable and it's the kind of incentive that we could mm -hmm. share with the world that, that doesn't put us in a position, you know, the incentive where we influx cash yeah. to a business and say here's half a million dollars or whatever to move your business here, that is soon forgotten, dried up, and again when the offer comes from Connecticut, 
they jump ship. But, but that is something that is not likely to change or not likely to be too watered down, not to use bad phrasing if you have <laughs> no water. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's like, but it's also... It has staying power. It has, not only has staying power, but it takes no state investment, really. Right. <laughs> um, there is, uh, I just, so 15 to 27 percent, I thought that that study was 2005. I'll go back and look at it. This came up just the other day in Brattleboro, and somebody, I can't remember who it is, um, I think the RDC director down there is looking for state funding to uh, upgrade that study to make it current mm -hmm. because they are being asked by businesses who they're trying to recruit here is what's that differential and 2005 data is not yeah, enough for a business yeah. today. So, um, I, and literally this was just last week, so uh, it's interesting that it comes up again. But that notion, um, one of the things that makes that differential strong is we have something called Vermont origin rules here. So when you talk about granola and food, it's slightly different than if you're thinking about making renewable energy panels. Um, but the, to use the word Vermont in your name, especially when it comes to food, it, it's not about where you're located. It's where your ingredients come from. So some companies, for instance, uh, Cabot Creamery can no longer be, I don't know if you've ever noticed, their branding changed five or six years ago. They don't use Vermont in their branding because they can't because some of their milk comes from New York. So they had to sort of say Northeast, uh, which is, it's a problem for us because we want the <laughs> cabin to say Vermont <laughs> everywhere. We want to be part of their marketing. I think there's still a picture of Vermont on the label, isn't <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, but, but there's other, you know, there's other instances of that. But I think um, overall, there's there's plenty. I think the concept is a good one and one that we've got to, got to look at. Yeah, and then yeah. So I, I'm not in the food business, but I am in the products business. Yes. And. and Reliance yeah, upon, upon our land, yes. <laughs> we sell, you know, uh, on the Vermont name a lot. I mean, obviously we believe it's an advantage, but it's an advantage against the disadvantage in many ways. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, in the last two years, I have been approached by four other companies in other parts of the country that are in the general realm of business I'm in looking to uh, every case that was... Uh, uh, small companies where the owner was retiring, nobody within an existing company was ready to take over, and we're pretty well known, so it's like, would you be interested in buying us out? And, and so I'm looking at it in terms of, okay, bringing it here, mm -hmm. we have the opportunity for capacity, this is, you know, we love this idea, day. growing, small business growing, um, yeah. And, and I'm looking at it, and, you know, and their cost of production in rural Missouri or Michigan or Maine is completely different than mine. And I cannot move those businesses here and be competitive in, with, with those products. What's we have driving, what is, can you narrow that down for us to understand what's driving that <coughs> cost? Labor cost. Labor cost. It's labor cost, pure and simple. And so we, I mean, we already know that we have a ceiling on our business because of our cost. I mean, largely it's because we're competing against China, but we're competing against other states as well with their policies. Mm -hmm. And I'm not complaining about what we have necessarily. My big beef is about our trade policy internationally, but, uh, yeah, that'd be nice. but, but the reality is that, uh, you, know, you talk about recruiting companies in the Vermont. Why? You know, we're not exactly geographically beneficial. You know, you're never going to see a central Amazon up here. Um, no, you know, it, want that <laughs> no, but you, you got you to bring things in, yeah. and you got to be able to get them out. And gosh, you get a snowstorm now, and UPS and FedEx don't even work. <laughs> hugely frustrating. Um, but and, and I'll just, since I mentioned Amazon, I'll go back. Yes, there's damage to the downtowns. I have 10 full-time equivalents right now because of what we sell on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, you know, it cuts two both ways. ways yeah. And you gotta, you gotta think about both sides of it. I'm not a lover of the company, but it's the reality of retail in the modern age. It's interesting, uh, Vermont Teddy Bear Company uh, up in Shelburne 
they hire 600 workers from uh, November 1st to mid-February, um, and their whole business model is those holidays within there. Uh, they have a problem finding 600 workers and who want to work for three months in that short period of time. Um, but they, part of that has been because they talk about how Amazon has changed their business uh, in some ways for good, uh, and it's not easy to, to do, but I think all Vermont companies are, who are in that, certainly in that retail, are, are looking at that. So that, those are some interesting thoughts. Somebody else, Jen, you have a... Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say quickly, kind of following up on the use of <coughs> idea and VPR, there is an episode of Brave Little State. If you're not familiar with that, it's the yes. People Power podcast, which is about youth flight, which does point out that the numbers do actually support that it's not lower, and they are actually, there's very small incremental growth. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do have to say, you know, the issues that have come up, notwithstanding, it's not easy necessarily for those folks to be here in it. Could you know? There's certainly a lot more the state could do in order to make it easier for people to move here and have families and pay taxes. <laughs> so I, I'd like to make a few points first. Um, in terms of telecom, the 300 million dollar budget, um, I suspect if you went to EC Fiber and asked them to engineer the rest of the state, the number would come in much lower much than lower. that. Much lower. It's a good point. Um, somebody asked about a. A potential renewable energy legislation piece. So I own Kennedy Brothers and Virgins. I want to put in solar panels and I can't because Green Mountain Power won't let me. So they're at the net metering cap? Because they're they have a limitation on their grid in terms of yep. pumping power in. So to our legislatures, how about mandating that red zones are eliminated in the state of Vermont so anybody who wants to at least has the opportunity to put in a solar array. Because right now in the entire Virgins area, you can't. Um, affordability. This, this always bugs me because if you talk to anybody who lives in any city in the United States, the affordability in Vermont is easily twice as good as any major city in the U.S. And yet every major city in the U.S. attracts gazillions of young people, in spite of the quote-unquote unaffordability of it. You know, so. I really don't understand the affordability argument at all, and I wish someone could explain it to me, because there is nowhere that people want to move that is affordable. So, I don't, I mean, that's not a distinguishing characteristic in Vermont, so. Not so. <laughs> yeah, we're not unique at all, so I, I, I don't see that as really an impediment, because when people look at where to go, you know, Boston, New York, D.C., California, they are way less affordable, in spite of the fact that the salaries are higher, they're still less affordable. Um, so I, I think we need to reframe that argument somehow. And uh, that's it for now. Can I make a comment? I feel like you've been taking notes for the last time. <laughs> Thank you. One of the uh, things that we run into a lot of times uh, in real estate, where you've got uh, a couple who calls, they're interested in moving here because one of them has been recruited or secured a job. So it's it's the trailing spouse. Mm -hmm. Talented so partners. Oh. Is the trailing spouse no longer the same? No, it's no longer the same. So I'm going to Sorry. Regardless of how smart or talented they might be. <laughs> but I think that's part of the affordability question is is that you know uh, if, if that second person yeah, were able to find yeah. employment, it wouldn't be an issue, it wouldn't be as big an this, issue. Yeah. This talented partner problem is so real in Vermont. Mm -hmm. I I feel like our HR hiring system is broken. It is. I, I, <laughs> I'm not sure if this is the case in every other state because I, I really just focus on Vermont, but um, even I hear this frequently in the talented partner piece where you know partner A gets the job and talented partner B is talented in their own field and you know and what happens is what I hear is the HR director from the one who got the first partner is calling their friends in the HR departments and other companies that they know going so I've got this person who's got this resume. Do you need anybody? Could you make a job? Like, I have to find two jobs to hire one. Mm -hmm. And oddly, that system uh, gets results, not all the time, but it gets results. Mm -hmm. And I keep thinking, is there some way that we could create <laughs> some 
some sort of process around that, or maybe just let it work. And when I said this before, somebody's like, well, you, it sounds like you need a Tinder for, for, <laughs> for job matching. And I, I actually think that's what like ZipRecruiter and Monster yeah. and all those other things are for, but it doesn't work because you know, I, I run a very small nonprofit, and when I try to hire something, I get like hundreds of resumes if I put it out on Indeed.com, and none of them right. are any that I want. Right. Mm -hmm. And I spend all this valuable time, and I know my, my experience is not the, the only one. And I also, because of my position, I'm on somebody's list. So I get a call at least once a week, hi Betsy, my name is Fred, Sam, whatever. And, um, I'm interested in moving to Vermont, or I'm here, my spouse got a job, or whatever the story is, I want to be in Vermont, but I need a job, I have a great resume, can I have coffee with you? And you know, I, I've said yes to these things for a number of times, I wouldn't doubt if you folks are on these lists too, but I find myself having coffee with a lot of people who are looking for jobs. Mm -hmm. And I always feel inept, because I am not a recruiter, I'm not in an HR, and it just so happens if you caught me that week and I heard about a job previously or the next week. Other than that, you're off my radar. This is not a good system. Mm -hmm. Let's call Betsy, let's call these 10 people who know everybody, and let's see if we can find a job. <coughs> Apparently that works for some people. I, I want to take myself off the list. I am not, I'm not that skilled in that. I, I want to be nice to these people, I want them here, but Oh, so you're a mechanical engineer, great. I don't know anything about that. I don't know how I'm supposed to help you. So I end up calling people who have engineers and you know they have coffee with them and the, the cycle continues. We've got to fix that. So what about, is there any data, maybe that some of the legislature knows, is there any data about um, the tran I don't know, transiency, if that's a word, of people that move to Vermont and then move out of Vermont within, say, two to three years? Does the de Department of Taxes track that at all? I bet they could. So the reason I ask that is because it makes me think of people who say, okay, I got a job, my talented partner doesn't have one yet, but let's, we love Vermont, let's try to make a go of it. Maybe we could make a talented partner a well, remote worker and get some money. I'm sure. Well, I think that's what happens. That's what happened to my wife, that's exactly how it works. Yeah, I'm so, sure if you go to, um, what is it? It's Global Foundries, you probably get great data there. Mm -hmm. Yes, they themselves have had a dwindling staff, and so what happened to the partners and even the people who were, who occupy those positions? Mm -hmm. Are they still in Vermont? Yes. I'm just really I'm cognizant of the time, so I just sort of want to wrap this up, and I want to say thank you very much to Rob for organizing this meeting. Thank you for the legislators who came. It's good to see a few new faces, and we'll be seeing you on a regular basis starting in January. So thank you very much for your time, and thank you, thank you for being part of the, the Chamber organization. Thank you.